Did the Godfather actors appear in The Sopranos? Yes. Dominic Chianese, known for Johnny Ola in The Godfather 2, is just one example. Lesser known actors like Richard Bright and John Apria also played significant roles in both, creating a riveting connection between these legendary mob sagas. Brace yourself for the surprising actor crossover that will astound you. Meet the maestro of mob drama, Dominic Chianese, the man behind the iconic Corrado Jr. Soprano in The Sopranos. But before he became the head honcho in New Jersey, Chianese strutted his stuff on off-Broadway stages, honing his craft under the watchful eye of acting guru Walt Whitcover. Fast forward to 1974, and Chianese found himself in the midst of mobster glory, scoring a breakout role as Johnny Ola in The Godfather 2. This was the turning point that catapulted him into the world of film, where he shared the spotlight with Al Pacino in hits like And Justice for All and Dog Day Afternoon. But don't let the tough guy exterior fool you. Chianese is not just a mob boss on screen. If only they knew the other side of you. He's also a crooner extraordinaire. In a memorable moment from The Sopranos' third season, episode 13, titled Army of One, Chianese serenades us with the sweet strains of an Italian love ballad. Goringrade. And who won't remember his hilarious anecdotes about the Chinese godfather or the blind man at the fish market? You hear about the Chinese godfather? He made them an offer they couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, whether he's orchestrating mob schemes, crooning romantic tunes, or even mumbling in the moss. South of the border, down Mexico way. Dominic Chianese proves he's the ultimate maestro of entertainment in the Sopranos universe. Meet the man, the myth, the wise guy, Albert Bariz, the unsung hero of Soprano land. Season two, episode two, Knight in White Satin Armor, was the birthplace of this Demio soldier a character who would carve his name into the gritty underworld of The Sopranos. Picture this. Ally Boy, played by the enigmatic Richard Maldone, struts into the scene, sharing the screen with Richie April. Little did we know, this moment marked the inception of a character who would rise through the ranks faster than you can say, Gabagool. Cousin to Larry Burris, Ally Boy's story takes a twist when Larry Boy gets the racketeering heat. Oh! In the blink of an eye, our man steps up as the acting capo, steering the crew through the murky waters of mob life. The Sopranos fans can attest, this guy left an indelible mark on the series. And if you think Maldon's only claim to fame is The Sopranos, think again. Our guy had a cameo in The Godfather 3, playing one of Joey Zasa's bodyguards. Did he get credit for it? Nope. But that's the thing about Ally Boy. He's the unsung hero, the silent force driving the narrative forward. Now let's talk about Maldon's audition for The Sopranos. He didn't just send in a resume and wait for a callback. This guy bypassed security like a true mobster on a mission. Picture Maldon strolling onto the set, locking eyes with James Gandolfini and dropping the bombshell. Someday I'm going to play on this show. Oh. Ballsy move, but hey, it worked. Interestingly, behind the scenes, Maldon's own life seemed to mirror the criminal underworld he portrayed on screen. His off-screen rap sheet reads like a script from a gritty crime drama, featuring a laundry list of convictions, assault, grand larceny, forgery, and possession of stolen property. In a plot twist that could rival any Hollywood script, Maldon found himself facing a staggering 15-year sentence for selling ketamine. However, this real-life drama took an unexpected turn, as Maldon, like a seasoned wise guy from The Sopranos, outsmarted the legal system and managed to evade the looming charges. <laughs> Step into the shadows of the Big Apple's underworld, where the legendary Tony Lip, the man who brought Carmine Lupertazzi Sr. to life, transcends the screen. Before his days as the crime boss in The Sopranos, Tony Lip was working as a manager at the Copacabana. But hey, even mobsters need a night out, right? Picture this. 1972, a smoky night at the Copacabana, and who strolls in? None other than Francis Ford Coppola. Destiny in the air? Absolutely. This chance encounter catapulted Tony Lip into the glitzy world of cinema, landing him a role as a henchman in the epic masterpiece, The Godfather. Talk about making an entrance. A blink and you'll miss it moment, but hey, every mobster's gotta start somewhere. Tony Lip's journey was a mobster's dream come true. 
Meet the man who turned stereotypes into cinematic gold. Jersey boy John Aprea, famously stereotyped as the bad guy due to his dark Italian looks. Ever wonder why he wasn't the iconic Michael Corleone in The Godfather? Well, he had to bide his time before landing the role of young Tessio in The Godfather 2. Playing opposite Robert De Niro and not uttering a word of English, Aprea considers it a career high point and relished the experience of working with the perfectionist maestro Francis Ford Coppola. But Aprea is not just a one-hit wonder in the gangster genre. Yet it was his brief stint in The Sopranos that added another feather to his cap. In the season one finale, Aprea brought U.S. attorney Gene Conigliaro to life, turning up the heat on a freshly arrested junior to spill the beans on Tony. According to Aprea, the success of The Sopranos lies in its ability to captivate audiences with the age-old tale of breaking free from injustice under the protection of stronger individuals. Despite his diverse roles, playing young Tessio in The Godfather, Part Two Inches holds a special place in Aprea's heart. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Lights, camera, wise guys. Meet Tony Sirico, the man behind the iconic Polly Walnuts Gualtieri in The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> who made the Veller tracksuit and wings in the hair combo a mob fashion statement. Before his days on the Jersey crime scene, Sirico had a cinematic journey that reads like a mobster's resume. Forget about the small roles. Sirico's big break wasn't handed to him on a silver platter. You might remember him from Goodfellas, Bullets Over Broadway, Gotti and Copland, but rewind the reel and you'll find him as an extra, blending into the background of The Godfather 2. Now let's cue the dramatic backstory. Sirico's path to the silver screen was paved during some quality time behind bars. Yes, you heard it right. Locked up and plotting his Hollywood takeover, he caught the acting bug. Post-release, he found his mentor in none other than Michael Gazzo, the man who brought Frank Pentangeli to life in The Godfather 2. Picture this. Two wise guys, one a seasoned actor, the other fresh out of the clink, sharing the screen as extras in The Godfather 2. It's like a mobster's version of a Hollywood origin story. Fast forward to The Sopranos, and Sirico's no-nonsense attitude and distinctive style earned him a permanent spot in the hearts of Sopranos fans everywhere. Pauly Walnuts Gualtieri, more than just a mobster, he's a cultural icon. <laughs> Meet Vito Antuafermo, the undisputed world middleweight champion turned Hollywood heavy hitter. From Italy to America at 17, he conquered the boxing ring facing off with legends like Marvin Hagler. But when the bell rang on his boxing career, Vito didn't throw in the towel. Instead, he became Donald Trump's bodyguard, delivered Coca-Cola, and worked the docks as a longshoreman. In the 90s, Vito made a knockout debut in the world of acting. Picture this, a one-two punch in Goodfellas and Godfather 3. In the former, he flashed a winning smile as a prize fighter greeting Joe Pesci's Tommy in a club. But it was in Coppola's masterpiece that he flexed more muscle as Anthony the Ant Squigilaro, the guy who casually dips his bullets in cyanide. For Vito, playing mob roles was a walk in the park. And his resume proves it, with appearances in Goodfellas, Godfather 3, and the ultimate mob saga, The Sopranos. There he played Bobby Zanone, the April crew associate who didn't mind getting his hands dirty, whether picking up garbage or handing it back to people. <laughs> Let's take a walk down the gritty streets of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and shine a spotlight on Richard Bright, the unsung hero of the Godfather trilogy and a familiar face in the mob-filled universe of The Sopranos. Born and bred in the heart of Bay Ridge, Bright found himself entangled in the world of Al Pacino early on. First, as his on-screen brother in The Panic in Needle Park in 71, and then, a year later, as his trusty bodyguard and cold-hearted assassin, Al Neri, in The Godfather. This guy was so good at playing the Enforcer that the Independent hailed him as one of the most powerful and suggestive characters, sitting or standing in the shadows. Despite his quiet demeanor, Bright's Neri was part of some of the trilogy's most memorable moments, shutting the door on Diane Keaton's K, bidding Fredo adieu to the fishes, and handling business at the Vatican in the third installment. Talk about a guy who knew how to make an entrance. While he may have pleaded with Coppola for more screen time, Bright's Neri still left an indelible mark. But it doesn't end there for Bright. He was no stranger to the mean streets of New Jersey. <laughs> In a season four episode of The Sopranos, 
he stepped into the shoes of grizzled hitman Frank Chrissy. In a single scene, he spun a chilling yarn about Chrissy decapitating a guy aptly named Tommy Neri. Well, Frank cut his head off with a hacksaw. Silent as a mouse pissing on cotton. Classic mob lore, right? Tragically, Bright's real-life story took a dark turn when he was hit by a bus in 2006 at the age of 68. A mobster on screen, a legend off screen, Richard Bright, you're forever etched in the hearts of the Sopranos faithful. Meet Frank Albanese, a man who traded his boxing gloves for a life in the spotlight after a brain injury forced him out of the ring. Thanks to his connection with legendary boxer Rocky Graziano, Albanese found himself stepping into the world of acting. Picture this. It's 1968, and Albanese lands his first gig in the mob drama, The Brotherhood. It's a minor role, but it's the beginning of a four-decade-long journey through the world of mafia-themed films. Now, here's where it gets interesting for all you Sopranos fans. Albanese pulls off a double whammy, appearing in two different Godfather films as two distinct characters. In 2008, he reminisced about his roles. I was the hitman in The Godfather, come busting through the room, and The Godfather 2, I was the Grand Marshal, leading the parade, and then they had this big shootout there. Everybody's running. But it's not just about the Godfather saga. Albanese leaves his mark in the iconic Goodfellas. Flashing one of the widest grins as Henry Hill's crooked lawyer, he recalls, Even though it was a minor role, I thoroughly enjoyed starring in Goodfellas. Albanese's most unforgettable role? No surprises here, The Sopranos. As Uncle Pat, he owned a farm where bodies were buried, and he had a knack for forgetting their precise locations. Uncle Pat was like Johnny Mnemonic, right, Uncle Pat? Huh? In the mysterious world of mob dramas, there's a behind-the-scenes tale that even the most die-hard Sopranos fans might have missed. Picture this. Don Tomasino, a character woven into the fabric of the Godfather trilogy, making his third cinematic appearance in Godfather 3. But here's the kicker. The original actor had already taken his final bow a year before filming. Enter Vittorio Deuce, an Italian thespian extraordinaire, stepping into Tomasino's shoes and, well, wheelchair. Deuce sat in the vacant throne of the fallen character, only to meet a cinematic demise that set the stage for Michael Corleone's ultimate vendetta in the epic finale. Yet, it was his role as Don Vittorio in a memorable episode of The Sopranos that resonated with American audiences. Wheelchair, a bully part. Picture this Sopranos moment. Our favorite Jersey mobsters gathered watching The Godfather 2. Tony Soprano, the boss himself, reveals one of his cherished scenes. Vito visiting a villa in the old country. What this thing needs is what we call a brogan adjustment. Fast forward to Naples, where Tony and the gang seek an audience with Don Vittorio. But instead of the powerful figure they anticipated, they're met with a weakened version, bound by a wheelchair, rambling about New York's bridges and highways. Georgia, Washington, huh? bridge. In the world of mob dramas, Vittorio Deuce became the bridge between iconic cinematic universes. And as his character mumbled about infrastructure, Sopranos fans were treated to a unique crossover that left us wondering. What if Don Vittorio had shared cannoli with the Corleones? Georgia. Washington. Huh? You think you know the cast of Goodfellas like the back of your hand? Think again. Ever caught a glimpse of your favorite wise guys sliding into the Sopranos? From Billy Bats to lesser known names that pack a punch, there's a riveting connection between these legendary mob sagas that'll leave you speechless. Get ready to be blown away by the unexpected actor crossover you never saw coming. Let's talk about Michael Imperioli, the man who made tracksuits look cooler than a polar bear in shades. Now you might remember him best as Christopher Moltisanti from The Sopranos, the nephew of Tony Soprano. But before he was mixing it up with the Jersey mob, Imperioli had a brief but memorable stint in Goodfellas. You want a drink now? Okay, I'll bring it for Yeah, you. well, give me a fucking drink. He played Spider, the poor sap who caught a bullet and then a dirt nap after crossing paths with Joe Pesci's short fuse. Lesson learned, never tell Pesci where to stick it unless you're ready to swim with the fishes. And here's a wild tale straight from the set of Goodfellas. Picture this. Imperioli's character takes a hit 
and is supposed to gracefully flop onto a glass table. But instead of a smooth fall, he crashes right through the darn thing. Glass everywhere, and our guy's bleeding like a stuck pig. They rush him to the hospital, right? And here's the kicker. Those nurses, they see the fake bullet holes from the movie and start panicking. They're treating him like he's on his way to the big sleep in Queens. So there's Imperioli, lying on the stretcher, trying to convince these nurses he's not about to buy the farm. Hey, I'm just an actor, he tells them. Motherfucker! But they're not buying it until they see the wires, the squibs, all the movie magic. Finally, they realize he's not on the mob's hit list, just a guy who took a tumble and got a little too friendly with some broken glass. I respect for this. He's got a lot of fucking balls. Good for you. Don't take no shit off nobody. You remember Sonny Buns from Goodfellas, right? That slick operator who owned the Bamboo Lounge where all the wise guys hung out, sipping drinks and plotting their next move? Well, Sonny's tail took a sour turn when he couldn't cough up the cash for protection. Say goodbye to the Bamboo Lounge, folks. But that's not the end of the story. Fast forward to The Sopranos, and you'll spot Tony Darrow playing Larry Baris, a capo in the DeMeo family. Now, Larry might have stayed loyal to Tony on screen, but here's where it gets juicy. Turns out, Darrow spilled the beans about his real-life ties to the Gambino family. In 2011, legal storm clouds gathered over Darrow as he grappled with accusations of involving Gambino members in debt resolution. The plot thickened as Tony pleaded guilty, anticipating a three-year prison stint. Yet, the script took an unexpected twist. A six-month house arrest, followed by two years of probation. That's You can't borrow another buck from the bank or buy another case of booze? After the legal saga, Tony emerged, claiming to have learned valuable lessons. But in the world of organized crime, as the saying goes, never say never. How the f*** are you? Excuse us. Excuse us. Let me tell you a couple of three things about a real tough guy turned actor extraordinaire. Tony Sirico, better known to Sopranos fans as Polly Walnuts. <laughs> Tony wasn't always running with the big dogs. He started off as a bit player in Goodfellas, just another face in Polly's crew. But then he hit the big time as the one and only Polly Walnuts in The Sopranos. <laughs> now, Polly wasn't just some run of the mill mobster, he was Tony Soprano's right hand man, a capo who knew how to get things done even if he had a knack for violence that'd make your grandma blush. But Tony Sirico's life story ain't no fairy tale. This guy had more run-ins with the law than you've had slices of pizza. Oh! From pinching nickels at seven to pulling off armed robberies, Tony was a real live wire. But then something changed. While cooling his heels in the joint, Tony had an epiphany watching some ex-cons doing Shakespeare. Can you believe it? He decided to hang up his gangster hat for good and chase his dream of becoming an actor. And boy, did he nail it. <laughs> Let's dive into the legend of Frank Vincent, the man behind some of the most epic moments in mob movie history. Who could forget Billy Bats from Goodfellas? Hey, Tommy, if I was going to break your ball, I'd tell you to go home and get your shine box. Yeah, that's the dude who lit a fire under Tommy and paid the price for it. I'll go home and get your shine box. Classic Vincent right there. Vincent and Joe Pesci's on-screen rivalry? It's like watching a heavyweight bout of loyalty and grit. They didn't just exchange blows. They carved out cinematic gold with each punch. But before they were mob tough guys, they were showbiz hustlers, slinging jokes in comedy clubs and jamming in cocktail lounges. Their journey from stage gigs to Vincent and Pesci, the insult comedy duo, is a plot twist in itself. Their big break? The Death Collector. And when Scorsese needed Billy Bats for Goodfellas, he knew Vincent was the man for the job but Vincent didn't stop there. In The Sopranos, he upped his game as Phil Leotardo, AKA the Shah of Iran. There's no scraps in my scrapbook. This guy had beef with Tony Soprano that was so thick, you could call it Ginny. And let's not forget how his demise in The Sopranos paid tribute to his epic exit in Goodfellas. Oh, and speaking of Phil, does anyone remember how many years he spent in the can? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Let's see who's got the memory of a made man. Want compromise? How's this? Remember Lorraine Bracco as Karen Hill in Goodfellas? She's the gal who dove headfirst into the glitzy mob life, only to end up knee-deep in trouble thanks to her hubby's shady dealings. But wait, plot twist. Fast forward a bit and Bracco's back in action. But this time, she's Dr. Jennifer Melfi, 
a shrink to none other than Tony Soprano himself. Despite both gigs involving mobsters, Dr. Melfi manages to keep her cool and steer clear of Karen Hill's fiery fate. Now, here's the kicker. Bracco was actually in the running to play Tony's wife, Carmela in The Sopranos. Can you imagine? But she pumped the brakes, worried her mobster wife vibes from Goodfellas might be a tad too deja vu. Smart move, Lorraine. Instead, she pitched herself as Dr. Melfi, and David Chase, the mastermind behind The Sopranos, was all for it. And let's be real, could anyone else have nailed that role quite like Bracco did? Am I right, Skipper? Yes. Good enough. What the f*** do I know? Remember Maury from Goodfellas? You know, the guy who just couldn't zip it? Yeah, that dude who owned a wig store and couldn't resist yapping with the mobsters. Hey, Jimmy, I've been looking all over for you, baby. Jimmy, can I talk to you a second? Hey, fuck him, what is it? Well, let's just say his chatty habits got him an icy surprise. Tommy decided to give him a new air conditioning unit, right in the back of his noggin with an ice pick. And then there's Chuck Lowe, who thought he could dance with the Sopranos. His character, Shlomo Titleman, struck a deal with Tony in one of those classic mob-style negotiations. But surprise, surprise, Chuck's character decides to pull a fast one, thinking he's smarter than the mob. Needless to say, that motel business deal got messier than a plate of spaghetti on a Sunday dinner. As the Talmud says, I don't give a shit what he says. Let's talk about Sal Bonpensiero, the man with a knack for cracking safes and breaking into places like it's nobody's business. You might remember him from the early days of The Sopranos, where he was Tony's right-hand man until things got messy. Sal wasn't just any soldier in the DeMio crew. He had a talent for sniffing out a good score. <laughs> but when his pockets started feeling light, he made a deal with the feds faster than you can say cannoli. Tony, being the boss he is, didn't take too kindly to his buddy flipping sides. And if you've ever watched Goodfellas, you might have spotted Sal lending a hand to Henry Hill, moving fur coats like it's just another day at the office. He might not have had a big role in that flick, but he sure made an impression. Hey, push. Do you even really exist? Remember Frank Pellegrino? Yeah, the dude who effortlessly switched sides from being a mobster in Goodfellas to an FBI big shot in The Sopranos. Talk about a double agent. In The Sopranos, he's Frank Cubitoso, the G-man with a vendetta against Tony Soprano and his crew. He's like a dog with a bone, chasing them down and pulling all sorts of shady moves to put them behind bars. But you know what they say about best laid plans? They often end up sleeping with the fishes. And get this, Pellegrino wasn't just a suit in The Sopranos. He had some serious mob cred in Goodfellas too. Ever heard of Johnny Dio? Yeah, that's him. The guy who's all about doing the dirty work, including handling the meat with Henry and Jimmy behind bars. I mean, everybody else in the joint was doing real time, all mixed together, living like pigs. You remember Marianne Leone Cooper, right? She made a quick cameo in the legendary Goodfellas as the missus of Tutty Cicero, Polly's brother. But hey, forget that for a sec, because you probably recognize her better as Christopher's tough-as-nails mom, Joanne Moltisanti, from The Sopranos. From Alcoholics Anonymous. What's your name? Well, we're anonymous. Cooper, born and bred in the mean streets of Boston, Massachusetts, to Italian immigrants, tied the knot with actor Chris Cooper back in 83. So next time you're watching mob flicks and spot this dame on the screen, remember she's got more connections than you'd think. I'll take that disc, man, and I'll ram it up your box. Picture this. You're watching your favorite gangster movies and suddenly you notice a familiar face. But hold up. It's not just any face. It's John Chacha, playing a pivotal role in both Goodfellas and The Sopranos. Now, it's no secret that in the world of mob movies, actors tend to bump into each other more often than a rat scurrying around in a Brooklyn alley. But what makes John stand out is that he's not just another forgettable extra or a one-time cameo. First off, remember that iconic scene in Goodfellas where Billy Batts, played by the legendary Frank Vincent, gets a little too chatty with Tommy DeVito? Well, guess who's right there soaking in all the drama alongside Vincent? Yep, you got it. John Cha-Cha. But wait, it gets even juicier. Fast forward a bit, and Johnny's back in action, this time in the world of The Sopranos. And guess whose crew he's rolling with? None other than Frank Vincent's character, Phil Leotardo. Forget my brother Billy. Phil, Phil, that's not what I'm saying at all. 
Lorraine Bracco might have tiptoed around the idea of revisiting the gritty mob world of Goodfellas and The Sopranos. But Suzanne Shepard? She dove in headfirst, no second thoughts. You might remember her as the no-nonsense mother of Karen Hill, but did you know she also played the formidable matriarch in The Sopranos? Yup, she went from giving side-eye to Henry Hill to giving Tony Soprano the same treatment. I never said that. And when Meadow came out, oh my God, she's so dark. In both roles, she nailed the part of the skeptical mother-in-law, raising an eyebrow at her daughter's choice in men. Just like Karen's mom wasn't exactly thrilled about her daughter getting involved with the local wise guys. My daughter says that uh, you're half Jewish. Um, it's just the good half. Mary DeAngelis wasn't exactly rolling out the welcome mat for Carmela's romance with Tony Soprano. But hey, when you're dealing with the mob, family drama comes with the territory, right? And now what the f are you crying about? The secret is out. You know that gritty vibe you get when you sink into a Scorsese flick? Well, meet Paul Herman, the unsung hero of the underworld, also known as the Pittsburgh Connection in Goodfellas. This guy's like the secret ingredient in your grandma's sauce. You don't see him, but damn, does he add flavor. So picture this. Henry and Karen, our dynamic duo, are on the hunt for a little nose candy. And where do they turn? Straight to Herman, the man with the hookup, the go-to for the good stuff. But that's not all this guy's got up his sleeve. Ever caught a glimpse of Beansy Gata in The Sopranos? Yep, you guessed it. That's Herman, too. I did. Then I put it in drive. Beansy's the guy who goes from mob life to veal parmesan sandwiches, running his own joint. Richie Aprile, the loose cannon of the crew, decides to settle some old scores and turns poor Beansy into a supermarket cart. He even promises to build a ramp up to his you-know-what and drive a toy train up there. I'll build a ramp up to your ass. Drive a Lionel up in there. Classic Richie, always with the colorful threats. In a storyline twist reminiscent of mirroring Marianne Leone Cooper's journey, Nicole Burdett went from being Frankie Carbone's nameless flame in Goodfellas to stealing the spotlight in The Sopranos. There, she slipped into the role of Barbara, Tony's baby sis who wisely chose the leave the gun, take the cannoli lifestyle over the mob drama. While her siblings were busy plotting their next hit, Barbara was just trying to plan a play date for her kids. But hey, even though they took different paths, Barbara always managed to keep Tony on speed dial for those family reunions. Jesus Christ, Paulie Gautieri. Isn't he dead yet? Carmine Lupertazzi, the man with the mob plan, ruled the roost of his eponymous Lupertazzi crime family on The Sopranos. Sure, him and Tony Soprano were like oil and water, one old school, the other with his finger on the pulse of the modern mob and wearing shorts. Don doesn't wear shorts. All right, come on, come on. But they managed to keep it civil, mostly. Before Carmine graced our screens, it was Tony Lip who strutted his stuff as real-life gangster Frank Frankie the Wop Manzo in Goodfellas. Blink, and you might miss him in that iconic bamboo lounge scene where Henry's voiceover speeds through the introductions like they're going out of style. And his guy's Frankie the Wop. Tobin Bell, primarily recognized as Jigsaw from the iconic Saw franchise, ventured into the Sopranos universe with a memorable appearance as Major Zwingli in the season three finale, Army of One. It's a brief but notable departure from his more sinister persona. Uh, this Army of One thing. What happens when each Army of One decides, uh, it, I'm not going over the top of the foxhole? Bell's presence in Goodfellas is equally subtle as he assumes the role of a parole officer, adding a touch of authenticity to the crime drama. While he may be remembered by many solely for his portrayal of Jigsaw, it's always a pleasant surprise to catch a glimpse of him in any cinematic venture. Well, let's face it. He might not have had the makings of a varsity major, but boy, did he have all the makings of a varsity psycho. Hello. I want to play a game. All right, let's dish the dirt on Daniel P. Conte, the man of many disguises. Sure, he had his moment in the limelight with Martin Scorsese, even popping up in Goodfellas. But it's his gig on The Sopranos that really made him a household name. Young and tall and tan and lovely. Enter Doc Santoro, a Lupertazzi family capo who thought he could outwit the great Phil Leotardo. But here's the kicker. Behind that sweet old man act lurked a conniving psychopath who'd stop at nothing to get what he wanted. Now you'd think a guy like Doc would have some smarts, right? Wrong. He couldn't even see the writing on the wall when he stole a bite from Phil's plate. Rookie mistake, Doc. Rookie mistake. 
and let's not forget his charm offensive, or lack thereof. Even before he offed poor Jerry the hairdo, it was pretty clear the family wasn't exactly throwing him a welcome party. Plus, the dude had a thing for hookers. In the end, it was no surprise when he met his maker, exiting a brothel with a bullet through the eye. No more Butchie. No more of this. Meet Vito Antuafermo, the undisputed world middleweight champion turned Hollywood heavy hitter. From Italy to America at 17, he conquered the boxing ring, facing off with legends like Marvin Hagler. But when the bell rang on his boxing career, Vito didn't throw in the towel. Instead, he became Donald Trump's bodyguard, delivered Coca-Cola, and worked the docks as a longshoreman. In the 90s, Vito made a knockout debut in the world of acting. Picture this, a one-two punch in Goodfellas and Godfather 3. In the former, he flashed a winning smile as a prize fighter greeting Joe Pesci's Tommy in a club. For Vito, playing mob roles was a walk in the park. And his resume proves it with appearances in Goodfellas, Godfather 3, and the Ultimate Mob Saga, The Sopranos. There, he played Bobby Zanone, the April Lee crew associate who didn't mind getting his hands dirty, whether picking up garbage or handing it back to people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you catch that hilarious scene on The Sopranos? Well, it's this. The actor Casso, who pulled some shady business at Goodfellas, later appears on the show as Martin Scorsese himself. Oh, oh, Marty! Kundun! I liked it! Imagine, Casso enters the nightclub as a genuine VIP, echoing Scorsese's signature style. I gotta admit, the first time I caught a glimpse of The Sopranos, I was convinced Martin Scorsese himself had sneaked onto the set for a quick cameo. I mean, who wouldn't think so? Kundun! I liked it! Meet Frank Albanese, a man who traded his boxing gloves for a life in the spotlight after a brain injury forced him out of the ring. Thanks to his connection with legendary boxer Rocky Graziano, Albanese found himself stepping into the world of acting. Picture this. It's 1968, and Albanese lands his first gig in the mob drama, The Brotherhood. It's a minor role, but it's the beginning of a four-decade-long journey through the world of mafia-themed films. Now, here's where it gets interesting for all you Sopranos fans. Albanese pulls off a double whammy, appearing in two different Godfather films as two distinct characters. In 2008, he reminisced about his roles. I was the hitman in The Godfather, come busting through the room, and The Godfather 2, I was the Grand Marshal, leading the parade, and then they had this big shootout there. Everybody's running. But it's not just about the Godfather saga. Albanese leaves his mark in the iconic Goodfellas, flashing one of the widest grins as Henry Hill's crooked lawyer. He recalls, even though it was a minor role, I thoroughly enjoyed starring in Goodfellas. Albanese's most unforgettable role? No surprises here, The Sopranos. As Uncle Pat, he owned a farm where bodies were buried, and he had a knack for forgetting their precise locations. Uncle Pat was like Johnny Mnemonic, right, Uncle Pat? Huh? If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on the Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.